Hey, it's great seeing all of you here today. And uh, I want to just share a song today. Uh, uh, this song has been requested a long, long time ago. And uh, I finally had an opportunity to fulfill the request. And uh, if you're familiar with the song, you're welcome to sing along with me. If you're not singing along with me on the chorus, I'm going to stop and start all over. <laughs> all right? So uh, if you don't know the words uh, very well to the verse, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you go on that. But, uh, you know, a wonderful thing about believers is uh, we were created for something even bigger than life here on earth. And so that's what this song talks about. And so uh, I hope that uh, you'll share in the song with me as I, as I sing it. Uh, certainly on the course we can sing it together, all right?
Psalm 31, 19 says, How abundant are the good things that you have stored up for those who fear you, that you bestow in the sight of all on those who take refuge in him. God's goodness to us, we can't even begin to explain how good he is. So this morning we're going to sing the goodness of God. I want you to join along with us. So as we sing, just thank God for his goodness to you. Because I know if you if you listen, you the words of this song can be absolutely true for any one of us. Because God has always been there for us and he always will be. And he is so good to us. So stand with us this morning and sing. We're going to sing the goodness of God this morning. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness. 
Today we're going to be over in the Gospels. We're going to be in Luke 18. Now I've been sharing a sermon series with you over the past several weeks. And uh, I've been talking to you about failures in the Bible who later became incredible heroes. So, I've been talking to you about people who went from zero to hero. And so, uh, I talked to you about Moses. Moses the murderer, who later became Moses the deliverer. I talked to you about Jacob the liar, who became Israel, the father of a great nation. I talked to you about Jonah the rebel, who came to preach God's grace to an evil city. But today we're not going to talk to you about Moses. I'm not going to talk to you about Jacob or Jonah. Today I'm going to talk to you about you. I'm going to talk to you about you. Let me begin with a couple of questions for you to consider. How many of you, how many of you would like to spend extended time befriending a hypocrite? Anyone? How many of you would like to spend extended time befriending a hypocrite? Now, whenever you choose a friend, are you looking for a hypocrite to be your buddy? Now, many of you would like to be members of a church that does not have even one hypocrite, right? You want to be members of a church that does not even have one hypocrite. I got one thing to say to you. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. Well, I even want to go a step further. I didn't see any hands raised. None of you wanted to befriend a hypocrite, and that says something about us. And what it says about us isn't that great, because God has called you and me to be grace givers. And who are we to be grace givers to? We're to be grace givers to those people who have sinned, those people who have never experienced God, and those people who maybe they experienced God at one point in time in their life, but somewhere along the way, they hypocritically fell off the wagon. Right? You know, I remember people in my lifetime, and I would be their pastor. I remember men who have come to me and they've said, Pastor Mike, I have done something terrible. I've been unfaithful. And, and you know, there was something way back deep inside of me in defense of their spouse that wanted to get extremely, extremely angry. But right there before me was this hypocrite who was repenting. And before I knew it, I found myself crying my eyes out. Because Satan had wedged his way into their life. I've had somebody contact me and say, you know, Pastor Mike, I got a DUI. But what am I going to do? And, and in that moment, my heart just broke for them. I wasn't always that way. Matter of fact, I remember a time long, long ago I was pastoring at my second church. And there was a lady that I like to pass judgment on in my spirit. Have you ever done that? Have you ever found yourself passing judgment on someone? I kind of met this lady indirectly. 
Her mother was a great lady, and sometimes her mother, her, I mean, I'm sorry, her grandmother was a great lady, and sometimes her grandmother needed transportation to the doctor, didn't have a car. And so there were times that I would uh, drive Grandma to the hospital. But I really had a problem with this one particular lady who was close to my age, a little bit older than me. And my beef with her was that she didn't take care of her kids. And, and so there was this thing in my life that I held a grudge against this woman. Her name was Louise. I didn't like it when I saw Louise coming because Louise was going to always ask me for something never give anything in return, and whenever I did do something to help Louise, I never was sure that it was going to benefit her children, who she was not taking care of. So I judged Louise a lot harder than I would judge some of you today. Hey, I'm just saying, that was my youth. That was the way that I was at one point in my life. But I remember the lesson that God taught me. God has the funniest way sometimes of teaching us lessons. Ways that we will never, ever, 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 ever forget. I was going through a uh, situation to where there was one stressful event after another. Kathy and I had two babies at the time. And, and you know, if you're staying up all hours with your babies, and doing, life at home can be stressful, not to mention that there was stressful situations around me, people sick, uh, uh, a lot of things going on, and, and it was just a bad time for me and Kathy. And it was so bad that Kathy suggested I get out of the house and go play golf. She didn't want me around at the house. She didn't want me at the parsonage. She didn't want me close enough to where she would see my surly mood. So I grabbed my golf clubs. And she says, wait, aren't you going to call somebody to go with you? And I said, no, I want to be alone. So off to the golf course I went. In case you don't golf, let me tell you something. You can't golf mad. You may think you can, but you can't. It's not any fun. I was at this little nine-hole golf course, and I was coming up to the fifth hole, and I'm thinking, I am miserable here. I'm not having any fun. And I was to the point, I'm talking out loud to myself like I'm talking to you right now. And I finally said, no, by doggies, you came here to golf, and you're going to golf. So I set my ball on the tee, got my driver out, and I concentrated, and I hit a long, long drive over by this patch of woods. And I walked over to the woods, find my ball so I could hit again, and out of the woods walks Louise. <laughs> she had kind of a chorus, grating voice, at least it was that day, and she goes, hi, Brother Mike. <laughs> and I said, Louise, what are you doing here? And she said, I was just taking a walk. She was three or four miles from home. And she was out taking a walk and she ends up in my woods. <laughs> so we talked. And after we visited for a while, she headed on her way and I picked up my golf ball and went home. <laughs> but God had a way of teaching me that Louise, no matter how you looked at it, whether in that moment that she was taking care of her kids or not, Louise needed Jesus. And you and I need Jesus. There may be people in this room that we call family who need a new, new dose of Jesus, and you may be unaware of it. 
And if we're not careful, we might find ourselves being judgmental even when we don't mean to be. Mm. I said, how many of you would like to spend extended time befriending a hypocrite? Let me share with you. Whenever God's grace is applied to our lives and we're willing to befriend anybody, I want to tell you what, God's going to make up the difference. He is going to make up the difference and He is going to supply your life with joy that will help to compensate for any inconvenience you may experience from hanging around a hypocrite. I want to share with you, this is a great church. But there are times that we have all been hypocritical. There are times that we've all been hypocritical. And, and you know, somebody might say to me, well, Mike, that's the reason I don't attend church anymore. Because the church is just full of hypocrites. That's why I don't go. Well, you want to know what my response to that person would be? My response would be, hey, buddy, you're just being hypocritical about being hypocritical. Now, why do I say that? God has made it clear in His Word. God has made it clear in His Holy Word that He's going to work through what? The church. He is going to work through the church. And so whenever you believe in God, but you ignore about what God says about the church in His Word, then you're being hypocritical about being a hypocrite. Isaiah once said, All we like sheep. We've gone astray. We've all turned everyone to our own way. So all of us, all of God's people at one time or another, we have turned aside from that perfect will of God. We've wandered off the pathway. We're good at being bad. Sometimes and somehow Christians are capable of going from hero to zero. And all that's because of the hypocrite that can be in all of us. Now, I believe that the Christian heroes in today's world know how to do something. I believe that the Christian heroes of this world know how to pray. Right? So, Christian heroes in this world, they know how to pray. Many of you know the story about prayer, about the Pharisee and the tax collector. They go to the temple to pray. And, and today I'm going to read this passage of Scripture out of the New King James Version. It begins in verse 9 of Luke chapter 18. It says, Also Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. What did that mean, they despised others? It meant that they did not want to, to befriend any hypocrites, and they didn't realize they were hypocrites themselves. Okay? Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves. They were righteous and they despised others. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Some translations say the Pharisee stood and prayed to himself. He said, God, I thank you. I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. Lord, I thank you that I'm, not, I'm even not like this tax collector. Lord, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me. I said, I tell you, this is Jesus talking. He says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other man. For whoever, 
or everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, let me ask you, why did Jesus tell this story? I'll tell you why. First of all, he told this story because there were people in the crowd who trusted only in themselves. You may have a faith in God today, but if you trust only in yourself, you're going to stumble. Every once in a while, you're going to stumble. There were people who trusted only in themselves. They didn't think they needed anybody else. And so the Bible calls these people, Jesus called these people, self-righteous. These people despised other people. These people looked down on other people. And don't tell me that you've never done that. Because I know we have. You see, many of us have often spoken about the shortcomings of others. We call it criticisms. Speaking of the shortcomings of others. So look at the prayer of the Pharisee. He prayed to himself. He prayed to himself. Ladies and gentlemen, your prayers can't reach God if you're praying to yourself. <laughs> they can't do it. And, and then he took time out and he tried to remind God that he was above other people because of the sins he did not commit. Do you remember the rich young ruler, the story of the rich young ruler? You know, uh, uh, he said, Sir, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and so... Jesus gave him a list of the commandments, but he left one commandment off. you remember what it was? He left coveting off. And so Jesus, uh, the man says to Jesus, Oh good, I've done all of these since the day of my youth. But then now Jesus comes back and he addresses this man's problem of coveting. And whenever Jesus came back, he said, Then go sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And the man couldn't do it because there was one sin in his life. He cherished his possessions more than God and more than others. Mm. The Pharisee in Jesus' parable, he thought he was above other people because of the sins he did not commit. And, and he also tried to remind God, hey, I fast twice a week. He reminded God that he was a tither. But yet he was far, far, far away from God. But what about the prayer of the tax collector? Well, the tax collector, he saw his life as it really was. The tax collector saw his sin as it really was. The tax collector had been a cheater. The tax collector had lived an evil life. He had a lot of baggage back there in his life. But he was looking for something he knew he didn't have. He was looking for mercy and grace. Churches that thrive are full of mercy. Churches that thrive are full of grace. Churches that thrive and Christians that thrive are people who stand up for the Word of God while at the same time they offer grace and mercy to others who have failed those standards of God. The publican, the tax collector, he was willing to lower himself so that God would lift him up. That's what he wanted. Now, a few years ago, many of you will remember the story of Judge Roy Moore. He was a state Supreme Court justice in the state of Alabama. He refused to move 
the Ten Commandments from his courtroom. He took a stand. He refused to allow the monument to be removed. He stood on the laws of this land that were clearly defined in the Ten Commandments that are listed in our Bible. And he was right. And he also took the interpretation of the law that protects the separation of church and state in its original context, not what we have made it. Judge Moore stood his ground and he says the government is separate from the church for the protection of the church, not for the protection of the government. In other words, the government does not need to be protected from God. Instead, the government, our government, our nation, our land needs to be protected by God. Now, whether you agreed with the stand that Judge Roy Moore took or not, there's one thing that was certain. When the heat was on, he stood by his convictions and there was no misunderstanding who he was or where he was standing. In that moment he stood, there was not one iota of hypocrisy in Roy Moore's life. But every Christian, including Judge Roy Moore at one time or another, every Christian who has ever walked the face of this earth, we've all had moments of hypocrisy in our lives. And whenever a Christian sins, in that moment, you're a hypocrite. Why? Because when a Christian sins, you are going against something you claim to believe. Whenever Peter denied Jesus, on the night that Jesus was arrested, Peter was being a hypocrite. He had even told Jesus, even if all these others run away from you, you can count on me. I will never leave you. But he did. You know, we don't like this idea of even thinking for a moment that any of us could have ever been hypocritical. But as hypocrites, sometimes we try to hide our human weaknesses. We try to hide our vulnerabilities. And yet the Bible teaches us in the book of Galatians that we need as Christians to confess our faults to one another. And the purpose of confessing our faults and the purpose of admitting our weaknesses is so that we might receive strength and support from other Christians. Right? Let's face a fact. There's just enough pride in all of us that we don't want to be seen or caught in a bad light by anybody. Right? We want everyone to think well of us. We don't want any bad news about us circling the rumor mill, whether that news is true or false. Whenever I was pastoring my first church, there was a five-year-old girl that started a good rumor about me. Five-year-old girl. For the first four months that I pastored this church, I was single. And then Kathy and I married. Kathy moved from Arkansas to Indiana, and we began our lives as husband and wife. And this little five-year-old girl just loved me. She had a crush on me. And she saw Kathy as a threat to our relationship. And then one day she was out with her mother, and the mother was trying to invite people to church. Now, I was real skinny back then, and they had this saying, uh, I, I would go out and I would hear different ones would say, they would say, come here, our little preacher. And back then, I was still six foot two, but I was their little preacher. I was this big around. But anyway, Crystal looks at her mom in the middle of that, and she says, Mama, is that woman still living with preacher Mike? <laughs> Her mother did a 
good job of trying to explain the situation away. But I went to my second church, and there was another four or five year old little girl, and I had a similar experience there. Now, at that particular church, they didn't call me Mike. They didn't call me Brother Mike. They didn't call me Pastor. Instead, they called me the Preacher. And so Holly, thinking she was doing what everybody else was doing, she started calling me the Preacher. <laughs> she got it wrong. Now, I don't know... I hate to admit this, but there was just something that got under my skin whenever people called me the creature. <laughs> Even if it was by a four or five year old girl. But my point is this. By human nature, sometimes we are proud individuals, somewhat like this Pharisee. We don't want to be seen in a negative light. Regardless of what is said about us, whether it's true or whether it's false. And speaking of something that gets underneath my skin, did you know the word hypocrite in the Bible? Shortly thereafter is the word hypodermic. Isn't that interesting? If you look in a dictionary and you see the word hypocrite, just a few words down, you'll see the word hypodermic. You know, those needles that they put underneath your skin? Just like a hypodermic needle gets under your skin, so does a hypocrite. And, and that's why Jesus constantly complained about hypocrites during the three years of his ministry. The Bible even warns us in James chapter 3, verse 17. He says to live our lives producing fruit for God and avoid hypocrisy. But you know what? The reality of all of this is you and I are sinners saved by grace. And after we become Christians, we are still tempted to sin sometimes. We are still tempted to produce attitudes that can be unpleasing or self-serving. Hmm. You know, I wish that I could say that since I have become a pastor, that I have never, ever, ever done anything hypocritical. But that would be a lie. I've done many things, I've thought many things, I've said many things that were unpleasing and self-serving. Isn't it how amazing, isn't it amazing how vulnerable we are during a tough and stressful day? But the light that I want to see in the ministry of our church. When people come to see us, and just like yesterday, we handed out 83 backpacks, the most ever. Whenever we have guests that come into our, home, uh, into our church home, I want them to see the love, the mercy, the grace of God's people. When they see us, I want them to look at us and if any of them ever get in trouble and has a DUI or if any of them ever have trouble in their marriage that they would come to some of us and they would say now I can go to somebody there at Mount Zion because none of those people will judge me. They know what it's like. They know what those hurts are like. I wish people would have the confidence in us to know that if they come and they are burdened down with a sin that has captured them, that you and I would not only love them, but if necessary, we would cry with them and we would hold them. Because that's what Jesus has called us to do.
for the most part, I can honestly say, people, regardless of who they are or what they've done, they don't get under my skin anymore. I hope that means that God is doing a work in me. Because hypocrisy is driven by our pride. Pride is our rebellion to do things our own way. To seek some sort of independence from God. But humility expresses a genuine dependency upon God. And humility also expresses a dependency on each other. We need each other. The Bible says in James 4, 6 that God extends His grace to the humble person, but He resists the proud. Hey, in closing, I've been talking to you about the two men who went to church. They both looked religious. They both appeared and sounded religious. But as the story unfolded, we quickly understand the focus of each man. The Pharisee trusted only in himself and he looked down on other people. He was proud that he was not a robber. He was proud that he was not an adulterer or a tax collector. He looked on an outward appearance. He was so rigidly self-righteous that he missed the opportunity for God to change him from the inside out. So, a hypocrite, of which we are, all are sometimes, a hypocrite trusts only in self. They may claim to trust in God, but they trust in themselves. A hypocrite sometimes pretends to be something that he or she is not. A hypocrite is someone who pretends or believes to be better than they really are. A hypocrite claims to be righteous, and yet they intentionally withhold love to certain people. But in closing, I want to remind you of the other side of the story. Jesus says, whoever humbles himself, that person will be exalted. The tax collector was humble. He was completely aware of his sinfulness. He was looking to God for mercy and forgiveness. Because he was humble, he was quick to confess his sins. But he was slow to point out any sins in other people. And humility asks for and receives God's forgiveness. And that same humility is quick to forgive others. The humble recognize that humility puts us in a position to hear from God. And it's an attitude of the heart. I've spent the last four weeks talking to you about going from zero to hero. You want to know how you can become a hero? You want to know how you can be heroic in this Christian age whenever the world is so sinful around us? Start developing a heroic prayer life. Start developing a heroic prayer life. If we ever want to go from zero to hero, it will be through heroic prayer. And that's what God has called each and every one of us to do right now. Father God, I pray that you will take this message, that you would bless it. Help us all to be exactly what you would have us to be. And help us never to waver from it one iota. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Would you stand together? If you have a need to come and pray, I would consider it an honor to be able to pray with you today. Let's uh, sing this closing song of praise together.
God, thank you for this service today. Lord, I pray that you be with the offering that will be received as we leave today. Be with the activities of this week. May we be found this week in the center of your will. For it's in Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming today.